Thank you. Let me start by thanking the organizer for, organizers for inviting me here and have the opportunity to share my work with all of you. Um, as you might have seen in the program, this is work from Brown University and where we looked at magnetic excitations and dynamics on a honeycomb iridate. But, and this is a bit of an advertising, advertisement, I just recently moved to Boston to Northeastern University to a beautiful new building and a very empty lab. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'll be doing optics and time resolve measurements over there in combination with uh, restaurant x-ray measurements and some ARPES too. So if you have no or know of anyone that might be interested in doing a postdoc or a PhD, please let me know. I'm looking <laughs> to fill in that lab with people, not just equipment too. <laughs> All right, um, but this talk, uh, what it is, is really is a talk about emergence, right? It's this idea that you can, the properties of a system are very different from the properties of the, each of individual constituents. And those emerging properties really depend on the rules that you consider. A very clear example is, you know, many of you probably have seen this before, is a cellular automaton and the idea that you have some one or zero cells that can evolve depending on the, cir the surrounding cells. And you know, if you look at the patterns that emerge as you let the system evolve, you have many different symmetries that you might have if you consider one or two of one of the individual cells. Now, another example that everyone knows, but I think it really exemplifies this idea that you can change the properties, the emerging properties if you change the rules, is Lego, right? Everyone has had play with Lego. I usually, I like to take Lego pieces, I didn't do it this time, and ask my audience to build some emergence from me. I gave a talk in Notre Dame and they built this weird pattern out of it. And you know, when you really look at the rules that Lego wants you to build, you get this. <laughs> <laughs> so it really shows that you can, with the same subset of the same elements, you can really create the very different emerging properties if you change the rules. And I think this really applies to, to quantum materials and quantum materials is a very broad term for me are materials that display emergent phenomena in many different energy scales and length scales. And you know, from the interplay of the different constituents, you can get very complex and different ground states from topological states to complex magnetism to superconductivity. But this idea is, can we play with the rules and can we change the, magnet, the, the microscopic properties on demand, right? And this is not known. People have been doing this with strain, pressure, chemistry. But what I like is the idea that you can use ultra-fast light to do this because ultra-fast light is reversible. When you remove your light, in principle, the system should come back in some time scale to the original state. You can do it, you can interact with the microscopic uh, constituents in the, in the right time scale. You can implement it with many different probes and then hopefully you can access uh, phases of matter that have, uh, they don't have an equilibrium counterpart. And this is a bit of self, self this is a bit of advertisement, this, don't put an adjective on it, but we put a review a few years back discussing these ideas that you can use light to control the non-thermal properties of materials and achieve new functionalities. Okay, um, but this is very broad. Um, how do we go from here to my, the title of my talk, we need a few ingredients. So, you know, we're going to make a cake, I guess. <laughs> uh, first is what ground state we're going to consider to start studying these ideas. And, and these are uh, quantum spin liquids. And very broadly, because I'm pretty sure people here know much better how to define these things that I do. I'm not a theorist. But to me, they, it's a ground state where you have highly correlated fluctuating spins that they don't order at low temperatures. Now, the traditional example, and your um, experimental signature. So if you have ice in the spins on a triangular lattice, if you have antiferromagnetic correlations, one spin is up, the next is down, what does this guy do? It's frustrated, of course, in real materials you can relieve that frustration. But extending this to um, an observable, what you will have is a magnetic susceptibility that does not show any onset of order, you don't have any uh, divergence or any transition in there. There might be some energy scale where you start to have, you know, either because you have impurities or you have um, some spin glass physics, you have some upturn, but then what you have is um, critical, uh, a curie vice temperature 
that is much higher than at any temperatures at which you observe any discontinuity. So there are correlations there that signify by a high revised temperature, but you don't observe any onset of order. The example that's been mostly studied nowadays and more famous is the Kitaev quantum spin liquid limit. Why? Because it's numerically solvable. And what's the idea from my experimental understanding here is that you have a Hamiltonian that you can consider you have kind of spin, uh, icing spin like, um, icing like spins <laughs> in the corners of a honeycomb lattice that care about the real space direction. So you have very anisotropic nice interactions. And the only way to relieve the frustration there is to consider, well, a system that is the superposition of many fluctuating singlets, kind of a resonant advanced model. And then you can solve these by fractionalizing your excitations into you know, um, your fluxes that are localized and interacting with major, delocalized major animals. Okay. Why do I introduce this? Why do I care? Well, my second ingredient. There are some compounds where you can, there are some materials realization of this model in principle. And this happens on iridium oxides. And this is a very quick primer of how you can go from a 5D, a material that has in principle five electrons in your D shell to correlated physics and, and magnetism. So in here, you have a system that is half filled. So in principle, you expect something that is metallic because you have very degenerate uh, states. But now you need to realize that your atom is surrounded by some ligand environment. You're breaking the symmetry of those 5D states. You're enhance, enhancing some overlap between your 5D states and the, and the ligands. So you break the degeneracy. You still have something that is half filled. So then you need to consider another energy scale, which in this case is spin orbit coupling. So what you're doing is you're treating spin orbit coupling non-degeneratively, non-perturbatively. You need to consider it as one of the main energy scales of the system because this is a heavy element. So now you consider a different base, which is this J effective base, which is a linear combination of your D uh, orbitals and spin. Now in, that, in this base, you further break the degeneracy and you end up with a half filled band of some car of, with character J effective one half. The J effective one half is your kind of pseudo spin. And now correlations can open a gap. So now you reach from something that should be very delocalized, a correlated state that can host magnetism. And this magnetism is interesting because the pseudospin really cares about the iridium oxide octahedra is locked to the lattice. So you can have very many anisotropic interactions. You can also see here your manifold is very anisotropic. So now you can have not only your Heisenberg exchange, but then you can have other off-diagonal terms. And you know, this here already resembles this Kitai of Hamiltonian. But the question is, you know, can you play with the different super exchange pathways and find a way where you suppress the Heisenberg term, you suppress the other off-diagonal terms, and really reach a Hamiltonian that could be in a honeycomb, in a honeycomb lattice, uh, could be the same as the Kitai of state, the Kitai of Hamiltonian. And actually, yeah, if you now consider uh, two iridium oxygen octahedra in an edge sharing configuration, and you look at the iridium oxygen iridium uh, bond angle, there is a regime where your dominant interaction is this Kitaev like interaction. So near 90, 90 de 95 degrees for this uh, transition metal, ligand transition metal you might have dominant and sometimes even the only interaction might be Kitaev. This is the theoretical prediction. Um, so yeah, can we find a material where you have iridium oxide octahedra with an edge sharing configuration in a honeycomb lattice, such as we can find an implementation of the Kitaev Hamiltonian? Well, in real materials, things are never easy. <laughs> uh, the first two examples were alpha lithium iridium oxide and sodium iridium oxide. And as I said earlier, you know, this moves away from that expectation of a, a magnetic susceptibility that doesn't show the onset of order. These two compounds order a low temperature around 15, um, 15 Kelvin and, and 7 Kelvin, I think, if I remember correctly. And actually, the magnetic configurations are, are rather complicated. You have a zigzag order in this sodium iridium oxide, and you have a very complex spiral phase in, in alpha lithium iridium oxide. 
And what this tells you is really that the phase is space that you can explore by the fact that you have additional terms in your Hamiltonian is quite diverse. It's, it's actually very complicated. And the phase where you achieve any type of Kitai physics, it's very narrow. So people, and this is my third ingredient, came forward with ideas of controlling that magnetic, uh, magnetic Hamiltonian using light. And this is the idea where you use an excitation that is not absorbed by any of the resonance in your system. So you go in gap, you avoid that electric field to be transferred the energy to the system and you just consider the electric field oscillating within the, your material. You renormalize by that way uh, your, your free moving electron energy or if you consider a system, you're renormalizing your hopping parameters. And the idea is by doing this, by adding this additional periodicity, so now you have an oscillating hopping term. This is for a single chain. Now your band structure is going to vibrate. You're going to be creating copies of your band structure just because you have additional oscillations of the electric field. And the effective picture of what ends up happening is that you renormalize your band structure. You renormalize your hopping parameters. And then, you know, if your super exchange depends on the hopping parameter, you're going to modify your magnetic interactions. And that's what people, some people put forward. forward. Then here, this is a way to kind of show this magnetic Hamiltonian in a renormalized way, where they look at the, how the ratio of your Kitaev chain term changes with respect to the other two as a function of the light frequency that is interacting with this compound. And this, I should say, this is circularly polarized uh, light. And as you can see, there are regimes where um, at some point you get something that is fully Kitaev like. But to me, what is more interesting, because you know, when, when you're an experimentalist and you always do um, one of these ultra fast experiments, it's like, are you sure that you're not just hitting the sample? Are you sure that you're just not? dumping energy incoherently and you're not doing anything else that you cannot do with an oven or a furnace. The interesting thing is that you can actually modify also the other terms. You can maybe enhance the, find a regime where your Heisenberg interaction is larger than the Kita F or even play with some of the other anisotropies. And actually you can kind of explore, <coughs> explore this complete phase space. And you can think of a situation where, well, if I find a material that actually is a quantum spin liquid, can I use light to relieve frustration and achieve an order phase and really tell you, well, I'm not hitting the system because I'm actually achieving an order state. Okay, so those are my ingredients. Now I need to convince you that I've seen measured material that really hosts Kitaev excitations. And then I can tell you a little bit, because I haven't had that much time to do time-dependent measurements of what happens to the dynamics. And this is going to be an effort of like convincing you that my data hides an elephant under it. You're going, I'm going to show you blobs, and I'm going to try to convince you that those blobs really reflect Kita physics, and there is something more deep in there than just you know a hat. Um, so. To do this, the material of interest is this, the title material, hydrogen lithium iridium oxide. These, paper, these samples came out in polycrystalline form in 2018. And, you know, as I was saying, you can have things related to impurities, but if you remove impurity contributions, this really shows a featureless um, magnetic susceptibility. And then when they started to look at NMR or other type of measurements that can tell you if you have classy physics or any onset of order, they don't see any evidence of the onset of magnetic order or glass physics in this compound. But we wanted to go a little bit more deep. We wanted to look at the excitations. So to do that, I don't know if you're familiar, but we used resonant inelastic X-ray scattering. And the idea here is that you take an X-ray photon, you make it resonant with an excitation from a core hole into the empty states, and then you look at the scatter light that has transferred some energy into the system. And you, know, you can also do this as a function of momentum, so you can resolve excitations, uh, the dispersion of those excitations. 
Now, the idea is that the energy that you've transferred really reflects some excited state of your transition metal. So this is at resonant with the iridium uh, L3H, so from 2P3 half to 5D. And what are those excitations? Well, um, if you know, you consider, maybe I'm getting into deep waters here, but if you consider a, a free energy or a green function description, you can think that the excitations of your electrons somehow reflect, reflect your interaction with the spin waves or phonons or even intrinsic electronic excitations like the charge transfer or DD excitations. And you can resolve these as a function of energy at what energy transfer they happen and also as a function of momentum. So we are going to focus really in this low energy part for us, right? You need to think that these are 11.2 kilo electron volt photons. We're going to measure in things that are in 200 MeV energy transfer with a resolution of 20 MeV. This is not neutrons. This is not at the level of resolution that you would like to have. Nonetheless, this is how the experiment looks. <laughs> photons come this way. You, it's hard to see, but there's a cryostat in here. The scatter electrons come this way, and then there's a photon analyzer, which does bracket scatter those uh, scatter photons. And just because you allow them to disperse, you can move this CCD detector, and depending where they are, and by trigonometry, they tell you about the energy of those scatter photons. OK. So data. Uh, and here's the blob. Here is the hat or elephant. Uh, you see something that is very broad, um, doesn't disperse. You can map the very own zone. You can access very different points in the, in the high symmetries in, in the reciprocal space. And what you see is this damp harmonic oscillator that extends up to 150 MeV, centered around 35 MeV. And within our resolution, the data is identical everywhere. It resonates, so it really is an indication that these are intrinsic excitations to the iridium. And because we resonate here and at this energy, we know they have magnetic character. We can also look at the temperature dependence. And again, almost no change. But there is a tiny difference, which is that it softens as you cool down. And it really follows the magnetic susceptibility. And this softening is more marked around Curie Weiss. So this really is showing the fact that you have correlations in the system. This is not just um, your paramagnetic interactions at room temperature. You really have some different type of correlations as you cool down. And the onset around where, or like the softening is more clear around Curie Weiss. And it kind of follows this double hump structure. And this is understood also as the, so this is short range correlation onsetting. And then you expect, you know, Curie Weiss to be the long range correlation onsetting. Um, now, there are always caveats when you discuss data. And one of the things is that, well, are you sure that this is really Kita F and you don't have some type of local interactions, local Heisenberg spins interacting that are disordered? In this case, this resonant valence one model idea, if you look at your SQ omega, which reflects, you know, the spin spin correlation function, you wouldn't expect to see anything at gamma. We see this hump at gamma, so we rule out this description. Now, another question is like, well, are you sure you don't have short range correlations that are just not k type? Maybe you have some Heisenberg interactions and your system is disordered because these crystals are intrinsically disordered. And if that were the case, a good comparison point are you know, the other known k type magnets. And in those cases, you see, if you integrate your rig signal, you see areas of high intensity and low intensity, which follow the, uh, this will be the ordering vector of your spiral phase. And here the same, this will be, these are above the transition temperature. So they are just a way to see the remnant uh, short range correlations that have, that still remain above the transition temperature. So we looked at momentum space, and this is a way to try to summarize it. We don't see any periodic modulations. We don't see anything that might reflect the existence of short range correlations. And this intensity modulation, we have ways to say that they are not uh, intrinsic to the material. They are just due to the way that we do the measurements. Sometimes there are self absorption corrections that we can rule out. So we don't see any short range correlations. But also, we don't see any uh, presence 
of momentum symmetry. We find out that um, translation or any uh, momentum symmetry is broken. And as I was pointing out, I, I should say that, you know, before I say that, uh, something like this has been seen in these uh, other key type magnets. On top of this hump in those other key type magnets, you have dispersing spin, um, magnets. So, in the end, we conclude, as I was trying to hint, right, if you compare this to a key type models for uh, the, the spin correlation function, you expect to see a peak at the key type energy and then a long tail. We kind of see something like that, right? Uh, the only difference is that we don't see even that modulation of, of your SQ omega across the real so We really don't see any evidence for a momentum as we, we break all momentum symmetry. But in terms of energy scales, this will give you a kita F uh, exchange of around 25 MeV. I cannot tell you if it's antiferromagnetic or ferromagnetic because we don't see the modulations that one would expect. And we cannot rule out some still some gamma or J terms smaller than 5 MeV. But as I was saying, this material is highly disordered. Uh, if you look at powder, data, powder diffraction data, your Bragg peaks are, they have structure consistent with the stacking orders and some in-plane disorder. And if you were to model how disorder affects uh, your SQ omega, what you see is that you get this broadening and this your, your SQ omega becomes very much homogeneous across reciprocal space. And if I go back, right, like this is kind of what you will see. Like we don't see any difference between gamma and M in terms of intensity or even some, you know, push out of the spectral waves to the, to the edge of the zone. So in principle, or our conclusion is that yes, there is something important in this blob. Uh, you have a broad continuum that it's high intensity with, you know, center around 25 MeV with a tail of around 150 MeV, which that's kind of what you will expect in calculations for SFQ omega in a key type model. But there's disorder, so then we don't see any momentum dependence. So we think that to understand this compound, you really need to consider uh, key type quantum spin liquid systems or models, but including bond disorder. But still, the dominant interaction is Kitaf exchange, exchange of around 25 MeV. Now, we are not sensitive to any fractionalized excitations. There, are, there is evidence from thermodynamic measurements that at low temperatures, you have other spin excitations that are not consistent with the Kitaf models. But for the magnetic Hamiltonian, the dominant interaction is Kitaf exchange. So if I go back to the ideas at the beginning, well, can we do some time resolve measurements? Can we now get an excitation and see how these magnetic excitations with dominant key type exchange evolve after excitation? And can we see any type of dynamics? And can we try to understand if we can push the, limp, the system towards an order phase? So this is the caveat here is that these are uh, synchrotron experiments. These are not free electron lasers, meaning your time resolution is uh, 100 picoseconds. So we don't have any information about what happens in the uh, you know, few femtoseconds after the excitation arrives. We also relax the resolution. This is much lower resolution. But if we look at the regime that should reflect your uh, magnetic excitations, and if you take this, you know, with a pinch of salt, one might see, well, maybe there is some really, really long nanosecond dyna recovery dynamics after excitations. And this is, you know, this is a no floquet. This is really just first experiment where we say, okay, let's see what happens if we shine light that is absorbed by the system. And what is interesting is that if you compare this to previous measurements on, on uh, kita F magnets, what you see is that below the nail transition, you have very, very, very slow recovery dynamics. And understanding this is not trivial, and unfortunately, nobody has done much more since 2015. You can think that you're creating Holland-Dublin pairs that are being uh, 
prevented from thermalizing because of key type exchange. Um, but, you know, and that will be consistent with the fact that we see it in also in this compound. It will also explain why, you know, you see such a dramatic change above and below t nail. Although, in principle, if you, you, you have key type exchange, it will also be present. Um, you know, like we know that the, these excitations survive up to 250 Kelvin. So, you know, these are the next steps for us to understand. But this is the extent of all the time resolved data I have. <laughs> uh, right, so with this, you know, I hope I show you some interesting data on that compound that we really think it's one of the closest realizations of the Kitaev quantum spin liquid limit. And let me thank my former PI at Brown and, you know, the people at Sector 27 and the sample growers. And thank you for your attention.